Mr Greeney, just before you start again, um, it may be worthy of explanation to people who are mystified that during the section we've just done, you referred on a number of occasions to people attending with a friend. I did. Rather than giving their names. It's not, as I understand it, that they don't want their names mentioned, but it is because they were victims of the attempted murder charge and under a contempt of court act order made by Mr Justice Jeremy Baker in the trial of Hashim Abedi, they can't actually be named. Um, but for the purposes of the hearing hereafter, we are seeking from Mr Justice Jeremy Baker permission, if he thinks it appropriate, to name them subsequently. Indeed, sir. Thank you very much for Thank that you. clarification. So we'll turn in a moment to deal with Chapter 13, Radicalisation, and then with Chapter 14, Preventability. But before we do so, we want to acknowledge that people, particularly the bereaved families, may feel uncomfortable that we're moving with only a short break, maybe the lunch break, from considering each life that was lost in the bombing to matters relating to the person who caused all of that dreadful <coughs> loss. However, we hope that everyone will understand that there are issues relating to radicalisation and preventability that we think it's important to set out publicly at this early stage of our process. So first then, Chapter 13, Radicalisation and an overview of the evidence. One of the most difficult but also important questions the inquiry must try to answer about the Manchester Arena attack is why? Why did Salman Abedi carry out that evil act on the 22nd of May? What could possibly cause a young man of 22 years deliberately to kill so many innocent people in such an horrific act of violence? This is a question the chairman drew specific attention to in his introductory remarks on Monday. We will grapple with those issues in Chapter 13 when we turn to consider evidence about Salman Abedi's radicalisation, as is required by paragraphs 1.1 and 1.2 of the Terms of Reference. In seeking to understand how Salman Abedi arrived in a position in which he was willing to do what he did, we'll hear evidence touching on various aspects of his life. As we explained earlier, an overview of much of the relevant material will be given by Detective Chief Inspector, uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Simon Barraclough, the SIO for Operation Mantaline. But we will then consider each aspect in more detail during the evidence. What follows today, and follows now, is still very much a provisional indication of the evidence which will be heard, because responses to some requests for statements are still outstanding some disclosure still needs to be made to core participants and the proposed list of witnesses is still in the process of being drawn up. A full plan will be shared with core participants as soon as possible and their comments sought in the same way as with other chapters of the evidence. Whilst the vast majority of the evidence relating to radicalisation will be heard in open, it's also likely that there will be some evidence heard in the closed hearings which will inform, inform the Chairman's findings and conclusions on these issues. But that will be kept to the absolute minimum. As we wish to stress, this inquiry has no desire to hear evidence enclosed. We want as much to be in open as is possible. And we emphasise that the inquiry will only hear evidence enclosed where to do so would make terrorist attacks more likely or more deadly. We'll turn then to summarise the areas we intend to address during Chapter 13 before turning to some of the evidence in a little more detail. First, we'll consider the aspects of Salman's life relating to his immediate family. Statements have been requested, as we indicated yesterday, from Salman's parents, Ramadan Abedi, and Samir Tabal, as well as from his older brother Ishmael and younger sister Jamana. A statement has also been sought from his brother Hashim Abedi. <coughs> so far, no member of Salman Abedi's family 
has provided a substantive response. Ishmael has provided an unsigned statement asserting his privilege against self-incrimination or asserted privilege against self-incrimination, but no more. Ramadan has indicated that he does not intend to assist the inquiry. As will be obvious, this is most unhelpful. And we hope that Sam Lebedi's family will reflect and understand that they have a moral obligation to provide the information we require in order to enable the chairman to reach his conclusions. The inquiry legal team is in the process of following up on its requests, although this is made more complex by the fact that Ramadan, Samia and Jamana currently reside, as we understand it, in Libya and so are outside the jurisdiction. We have challenged Ishmael's claim of privilege, but he has reasserted it. The inquiry <coughs> legal team will continue to press him for answers. But in any event, whatever the ultimate level of cooperation or non-cooperation by the Abadi family with the inquiry, we will consider the evidence about the Abadi family obtained by Greater Manchester Police through Operation Mantelline, which includes accounts from others who can provide relevant background about Salman Abadi and his family, transcripts of police interviews with Ishmael Abadi, and material recovered from mobile phones and hard drives linked to Salman, Ramadan, Ishmael and Hashem Abadi. <coughs> Second, we will also hear evidence about Salman's friends and associates, including his wider family and relatives. Detective Chief Superintendent Barraclough has provided a summary of the information that was obtained by GMP from a long list of individuals connected with Salman Abadi during a trace interview and evaluate, or TIE, process carried out during Operation Mantelline. As we've indicated, the SIO will give evidence in Chapter 8 about the planning and preparation for the attack but he will be recalled to give this further evidence in Chapter 13. The focus of the TIE process was on determining whether there were any other persons involved in the attack or in its preparation. But in the course of that process, certain interviewees gave evidence which sheds some light upon the mindset of Salman Abedi and offers an indication as to how his violent extremist worldview may have developed. We'll hear evidence in the course of Chapter 8 from Ahmed Tangdi, a close friend of Simon Abedi, Azam Nami, one of his cousins, and Trial Witness 3, another associate of the Abedis. All three of these witnesses also have something to say about Simon Abedi's changes in behaviour in the months leading up to the bombing. All of that evidence will be relevant to the issues in Chapter 13. Considerable efforts are also being made to obtain evidence from a man called Abdarouf Abdallah. He is currently serving a prison sentence for terrorism offences and was visited by Simon Abedi in prison and contacted by, him, contacted by him by telephone on numerous occasions in the year leading up to the attack and before. We wish to understand whether he, Abdarouf Abdallah, had any role to play in the development of Salman Abedi's worldview or if he can shed any light on how it was formed. We have no doubt that Abdel Rouf Abdallah is a witness with important evidence to give. He was interviewed by the inquiry legal team on the 26th of June of this year but refused to give any answers to our questions, relying upon the privilege against self-incrimination set out in Section 22 of the Inquiries Act 2005. We are continuing to pursue this line of inquiry. As we've just said, the inquiry legal team considers that he may have evidence of very considerable importance to give. We hope that on reflection he will cooperate, but in any event, counsel to the inquiry will press for him to give evidence before this inquiry. Third, we will explore Simon Abedi's education. We'll hear evidence about his time in secondary school at Burnage Academy for Boys. 
at a further education college at Manchester College and Trafford College and then studying for a BSc in Business and Management at the University of Salford. We will consider whether there were any warning signs whilst he was at any of these institutions and, in particular, whether anything more could or should have been done to follow up with him when he suddenly dropped out of his university course in December 2016. Fourth, we will consider the influence of Salman Abadi's religious community. It has been widely reported that the Abadi family had links to the Manchester Islamic Centre, otherwise known as Didsbury Mosque. We'll hear from Hawzi Hafar, chairman of the mosque, about the extent of those links and whether anyone was aware of Salman or others in his family espousing extremist views. We're likely to hear other evidence about the operation of the mosque also, but that will need to await the calling of witnesses during chapter 13. <coughs> Fifth, and finally, the inquiry has obtained statements on behalf of various public authorities dealing with the systems and processes which are in place to identify persons vulnerable to radicalisation and attempt to intervene. We'll hear from Sean Hipgrave, Director of Protect and Prepare in the Office for Security and Counterterrorism, the OSCT, within the Home Office. Mr Hipgrave's evidence is primarily focused on security arrangements around crowded spaces and so will be heard in Chapter 7, as we mentioned previously. However, he also gives evidence about the government's PREVENT programme, which seeks to stop people being drawn into extremism or to de-radicalise those who have started down that road. And so we will explore this with him. We'll also hear from Paul Mott, head of the Joint Extremism Unit at HM Prison and Probation Service. Mr Mott explains how extremism is tackled within prisons and what is done to monitor or restrict visits to prisoners who are known to have extremist views or to have been involved in radicalising others. We'll consider whether enough was done in relation to such matters in Salman Abedi's case. This is an important issue, and it may well be that lessons need to be learned. The question that we'll pose is, how was Salman Abedi able to visit a prisoner such as Abdul Rauf Abdallah? In drawing all of this information together and analysing it, the Chairman will be assisted by two reports from Dr Matthew Wilkinson. Dr Wilkinson is a senior research fellow in contemporary Islam at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and a frequent expert witness in counter-terrorism or hate crime cases involving Islamic theology or <coughs> Islamist extremism. His first report explains the key features of Islamist extremism as opposed to mainstream Islam or ideological Islamism and the distinctive characteristics, including in attitudes to violence. It also gives an overview of the recognised pathways to radicalisation into Islamist extremism, the type of person vulnerable to such pathways, the main influences which might radicalise a person, the steps or activities which lead to radicalisation, and signs or indicators of radicalisation, how these can be spotted and what can be done to prevent further radicalisation or to de-radicalise a person. Finally, Dr Wilkinson's first report contains an overview of the problem of radicalisation in UK prisons and a summary of the known Islamist extremist organisations which operate in or have influence in the UK. Dr Wilkinson's second report on which he is currently working, will apply the knowledge and expertise set out in his first report to the specific evidence about Salman Abedi, which we've summarised already. We'll turn next to the facts in further detail. We're going to set out the key facts 
on issues of radicalisation, insofar as it's possible to do so at this stage, given that significant pieces of evidence, such as a response from Hashim Abedi and Dr Wilkinson's second report, are still awaited. In relation to Simon Abedi's family, the Operation Mantelline team gathered information from various relatives, including Rabba Abedi, Simon Abedi's aunt, who lives in Canada. From the statements obtained by GMP and other investigations done, we know that Ramadan Abedi, Simon Abedi's father, fled Libya with his family in 1993 and then applied for asylum on the basis that his life was at risk from Libyan state security. After several appeals, he was granted refugee status in 1997 and he subsequently obtained indefinite leave to remain and UK citizenship, as did his family. Ramadan Abedi changed his name to Hannah Joseph in 2002, but currently it's not known why he did this. He was reported to be associated with exiled Libyans linked to the Libya Islamic Fighting Group, or LIFG, which was a banned or prescribed organisation under UK terrorism legislation between October 2005 and November 2019. The Abedi family returned to Libya in 2011 during the uprising against Colonel Gaddafi. Photographs obtained by GMP show Salman Abedi at around this time with military vehicles and weapons. It appears that Salman Abedi and Hashim Abedi then came back to the UK in 2012 in order to pursue their education, but they did not engage very well with their schooling and started taking drugs. Ishmael Abedi told GMP when he was interviewed in the aftermath of the attack that their parents had asked him to keep an eye on his younger brothers, but he found this very difficult. Simon Abedi and Hashim Abedi travelled back to Libya in July 2014, but the situation in the country at that time was chaotic, chaotic and they were evacuated back to the UK along with others aboard HMS Enterprise via Malta. Images of Simon and Hashim Abedi in Libya over this period have been recovered from the social media account of their brother Ishmael Abedi and we'll show two such photographs at this stage. First of all, on the screen please, Mr Lopez, INQ 031259, 031259, page 13. <coughs> and so what we're able to see on the screen is an image of Hashem Abedi in, we believe, Libya with a rocket launcher. Next on the screen, same INQ reference, 031259, but page 14. This is a photograph of Simon Abedi raising a finger to the sky. At one time, this was undoubtedly a legitimate gesture used by many followers of the Islamic faith to state that there is only one God but it has been strongly reported that Islamic State has adopted it as a gesture. It is now often used by supporters of Islamic State to demonstrate adherence to what it describes as its caliphate and to its caliph, who in 2017, when this attack occurred, was Abu Bakir al-Baghdadi. We will need to consider whether this photograph of Salman Abedi in combination with other evidence indicates that what motivated Simon Abedi to do what he did was adherence to the Islamic State and or its ideology. Do we have any way of dating that photograph? We have no way of dating that photograph. Thank you. It can be removed from the screen, please. Salman and Hashim Abedi flew to Saudi Arabia <coughs> via Jordan in 2015 to carry out the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. 
and several friends and associates of theirs have commented that it was subsequent to this from around late 2015 that the brothers started to change their behaviour. Ramadan Abedi stayed in Libya and apart from brief visits to the UK has remained there ever since. It's not clear what the status of the relationship between him and Samia Tabal now is. Ramadan appears to have married another woman in Libya. <coughs> Salman and Hashem Abedi visited their father in Libya again in 2016 and in 2017, shortly before Salman, Salman Abedi returned to the UK to carry out his attack on the 22nd of May. As we've indicated, various friends and associates of Salman Abedi have said that they noticed that he began to express more extremist views and act differently from 2015. By way of example only, at the trial of Hashim Abedi, the uncle of both Salman and Hashim Abedi, Adil Forjani, explained that from around late 2015, he noticed a distinct change in Salman Abedi's behaviour. He described how Salman started wearing more traditional clothing, left his education, began to act strangely towards others, and talked about supporting ISIS, another name for Islamic State. A friend of Salman Abedi's, Ibrahim Khalifa, gave a statement to GMP and testified at the trial of Hashim Abedi. He described losing touch with Salman Abedi for a while, but then seeing him and Hashim Abedi again in April 2017, just a month before the attack. Mr Khalifa was surprised to see that Salman Abedi and Hashim Abedi had started wearing a beard <coughs> and traditional Islamic clothing, and that Salman Abedi told him that he and his brother had, to use his words, sacked off university and were going to Libya. The witness also recalled that on one occasion when he was watching television with Salman Abedi and a news item came on about ISIS in Iraq, Salman Abedi showed some sympathy for their aims. Both Salman Abedi's cousin, Assam, and trial witness three told Greater Manchester Police that Salman Abedi had been quite rough in his teenage years, smoking a lot of cannabis and getting into fights. He then seemed to mature and became happier, though a year or so before the attack, they noticed that he was becoming more overtly religious and Assam's mother warned them his views were too strong and they should not listen to him. Trial Witness 3 described Salman Abedi speaking about martyrdom and jihad to him in positive terms. The links between Salman Abedi and Abdul Rauf Abdallah are of significant interest to the inquiry. Abdul Rauf Abdallah is a British Libyan national who took part in the uprising against Gaddafi in 2011 and was shot in the back, causing him to be paralysed. Shortly after this, Abdul Rauf Abdallah was investigated for extremist Islamist activity. He was arrested on the 28th of November 2014 and charged with assisting others in committing acts of terrorism by facilitating travel and raising money to enable various others to participate in the Syrian civil war. Although initially remanded into custody at HMP Belmarsh, Abdul Rauf Abdallah was subsequently released on bail on the 29th of July 2015. On the 11th of May 2016, he was convicted and sentenced to a nine and a half year extended determinate sentence. He remains in prison. Abdul Rauf Abdallah appears to have been in regular telephone contact with Salman Abedi from 2014. We know from the analysis by GMP of Abdul Rauf Abdallah's phone as part of the investigation <coughs> into his activities that in the period between the 24th of July and 28th of November 2014, Salman Abedi and Abdul Rauf Abdallah conversed about martyrdom, including the martyrdom of a senior Al Qaeda figure. This is something we seek better to understand 
with the assistance of Abdelrauf Abdallah, so as to enable the inquiry to understand whether there exists an innocent explanation for these conversations. But as we've indicated, so far he has refused to assist. Salman Abedi visited Abdelrauf Abdallah at HMP Belmarsh whilst he was on remand on the 26th of February 2015. He was then in regular contact with the prisoner whilst he was on bail. Salman Abedi then visited Abdul Rauf Abdella in prison again on the 18th of January 2017 and was due to visit him on the 6th of March 2017 but did not attend. On the 17th of February of that year, Abdul Rauf Abdella was found to be in possession of an illicit mobile phone at the prison that he was then at, namely HMP Outcourse. When analysed, this telephone was found to have been used to make calls and attempted calls to Salman Abedi's number. And as will be obvious, this was just months before the attack. It seems to counsel to the inquiry that Salman Abedi's relationship with Abdelrouf Abdallah was one of some significance in the period prior to the bombing and we are determined to get to the bottom of it. There are some other associates <coughs> or friends of Salman Abedi who might also have had some influence on his radicalisation, but about whom we have significantly less information available because they are deceased or outside the jurisdiction. In an interview between the Times reporter David Collins and Abdallah Forjani, one of Salman's cousins. Mr Forjani said he believed that Salman may have been radicalised, at least in part, whilst he was in Libya by the children of Abu Anas al-Libi. Detective Chief Superintendent Baraklaf explains that it's been difficult to pursue this line of inquiry because no investigations can currently be carried out in Libya. Another possible link is Manzur al Anazi a Kuwaiti national who led prayers at a mosque in Plymouth, but who initially came to Manchester when he arrived in the United Kingdom in 2000. Mr al Anazi was arrested and interviewed as part of the investigation into a failed suicide terrorist attack in 2008 in Exeter because he was a close associate of the failed bomber Nicky Riley. No charges were brought against al Anazi. He died of cancer on the 17th of January 2017 and Salman Abedi was with him when he died. The funeral was held on the 17th of January 2017 and in order to attend it, Salman Abedi missed a planned, missed a planned visit to Abdul Rauf Abdallah in prison. After the 22nd of May attack on the arena, various items of property relating to Al Anazi were recovered from 21 Ellesmere Road, the family home of the Abedis. GMP's analysis of mobile phone data indicates that there was frequent contact between Al Anazi and Salman Abedi and Hashim Abedi, particularly between the end of October 2016 and mid-November 2016, but it does not reveal what they were talking about. As for the possible influence of religious instruction on Salman Abedi, we know, as we said a short time ago, that the, the Abedi family attended Disbury Mosque for some time. Ramadan Abedi performed the call to prayer on occasion, and Ishmael Abedi volunteered with the IT system and provided some private tutoring on Islamic teaching. GMP took a statement from Akram Ramadan, who said his cousin had been present at the mosque when the Imam preached a sermon criticising Islamic State and that Salman Abedi had approached the Imam with a killer look in his eyes. But none of the main leaders at the mosque who have given statements to GMP or the inquiry recall Salman Abedi being a regular or committed member, nor any particular trouble arising with him. The only exception to this is Mohammed El Saiti, head of Sharia law and imam at Disbury Mosque, 
who told GMP that he recalled Salman Abadi attending the mosque, although not regularly. He described one encounter with Salman Abadi, which has some similarities to the account given by Mr. Ramadan. Around the end of 2014, Mr. El Seti delivered a sermon which was critical of Islamic State. When he saw Salman Abadi at the mosque a month or so later, he reports that Salman Abadi stared at him with a look of hate. He also said that he'd raised concerns about one relative of the Abadi brothers, but would not disclose whom. The inquiry legal team has followed up with Mr. Al Sashi about this information, and it's hoped that we will receive his evidence. There have been, as is widely known, some broader concerns raised about the Disbury Mosque. One of the imams, Mustafa Graf, was suspended on the 26th of May 2017 as a consequence of a photograph of him surfacing, which showed him wearing combat gear in Libya. It appears that Mr. Graf also encouraged a protest outside the United Arab Emirates Embassy in London on the 9th of September 2015 against the arrest of men for being members of Islamic State. And it appears that Salman Abedi also attended that protest. In August 2018, counter-terrorism policing obtained an audio recording of a sermon apparently given by Mr. Graf at Didsbury Mosque in December 2016, in which he appeared on the face of it to encourage participation in the war in Syria. However, following an expert assessment of the sermon by Robert Gleave, Professor of Arabic Studies at Exeter University, who considered that Mr. Graf was using rhetoric to encourage charitable donations to help Syrians in distress, counter-terrorism policing reached the conclusion that there was no prospect or reasonable prospect of conviction, and so Mr. Graf was not arrested or interviewed. It isn't known whether Salman Abedi was at the mosque at the time of the sermon, and Mr. Graf has said that he did not know him. It's only fair that we should point out that Mr. Hafar, the mosque chairman, has expressed concern that the BBC reporting of Mr. Graf's sermon was unfair and inaccurate, and that other media reporting linking Salman Abedi and another Islamist extremist, Rafael Hosti, who joined Islamic State and is believed to have been killed in an airstrike in Syria, with the mosque, has also been unfair and misleading. We assure all that we will be looking closely at all of these issues concerning Didsbury Mosque. It appears that Salman Abedi may have attended several other mosques in the months and years leading up to the attack as well, including the Al Khan Mosque and the Salam Community Association and Masjid. However, he does not seem to have been an active member or regular attendee at either. In terms of Salman Abedi's education, Ian Fenn, the head teacher of Burnage Academy, describes how Salman Abedi was not a good student at school. He attended that school from August 2009 until May 2011. He was, on one occasion, excluded for several days for theft. Mr Fenn's recollection is that Salman Abedi was badly behaved and arrogant and that he gave the impression of not responding to discipline from his father. However, there was no strong sign of strong religious feelings nor any indication of extremist views, as Mr Fenn recalls it. Rachel Pilling, Head of Department for Student Support at the Manchester College, which Salman Abedi attended from the 18th of September 2012, until the 18th of December 2013, described Simon Abedi as a poor student who exhibited problem behaviours, including intimidating a female student. On one occasion, he was disciplined for assaulting a female student. However, his brother did improve, she says, after Simon Abedi's older brother, Ishmael Abedi, intervened. And moreover, she says that there was nothing to suggest any extremist views over that period. 
Michelle Leslie, Vice Principal at Trafford College, which Simon Abedi attended from September 2014 until June 2015, explains that he was unremarkable. Once again, he was unimpressive, but he gave no cause for any serious concern. On one occasion, a tutor saw an image on Simon Abedi's computer of him holding a gun whilst in Tripoli, but his explanation that his family had lots of land in Libya and he used to go shooting there was accepted. Finally on this topic, Andrew Hartley, General Counsel at the University of Salford, has provided a statement describing how Salman Abedi did not stand out in any way whilst he was studying for a BSc in Business and Management and had limited interaction with other students and staff. However, as Mr Hartley explains, Salman Abedi essentially dropped out of his course from around December 2016 and failed even to attempt his exams in January 2017. Following the arena attack, the university commissioned an independent review of its response to Salman Abedi and whether the university's responsibilities under the prevent duty were met. The review found that the university had discharged its prevent duty adequately. However, it also found that there was a missed opportunity to intervene with Salman Abedi in early 2017 after he disengaged from his course, but that it was impossible to say whether any such intervention would have made a difference. Again, this is an issue the inquiry will explore. What then are the issues for consideration by the inquiry in chapter 13? In evaluating the evidence on radicalisation, we will seek to understand, with the expert assistance of Dr Wilkinson, how and when Salman Abedi's worldview became radicalised into one of violent Islamist extremism, considering in particular the role of his family, religious education and instruction, material available on the internet and friends and associates. We'll consider too whether there were any signs of Salman Abedi becoming radicalised during his time at Burnage Academy, the Manchester College, Trafford College or the University of Salford. We'll assess whether there were any signs of Salman Abedi becoming radicalised at Didsbury Mosque or other religious institutions and we will consider what form of intervention, if any, could have been made to de-radicalise him, and if so, who should have taken it and when? We turn next to <coughs> Chapter 14, preventability, preventability. Chapter 14 is the final substantive section of evidence which the inquiry will hear. It relates to the issues set out at paragraphs 1.3 to 1.11 and 2.4 of the terms of reference, namely whether the attack on the 22nd of May could have been prevented by the authorities. We have called the set of issues preventability for short throughout the course of our process. In this, the 14th chapter of the evidence, we will examine what intelligence or information was or should have been available to the security service, MI5, and or police about Salman Abedi and his plans prior to the attack. We will look at how that intelligence or information was assessed, investigated and shared, and what steps were taken as a result. We will consider whether what was done was reasonable in all the circumstances and whether the systems, policies and procedures in place were working as they should have done. In short, we will look at whether the authorities missed an opportunity or opportunities to prevent the attack upon the arena. We, as counsel to the inquiry and solicitor to the inquiry, are very conscious that preventability is of acute interest to the bereaved families and indeed to the public at large. One of the most important roles of this inquiry is to understand
whether anything more could and should have been done to stop Simon Abadi before he attacked and to make recommendations that might help the authorities stop anyone doing something similar again in the future. As is already known, we will hear live evidence from a very senior officer of MI5 of what was known by MI5 about Salman Abedi and Hashim Abedi before the attack. He will give as much evidence as is possible in open, subject only to the constraints of national security. We will give the same intense scrutiny to evidence of the decisions and actions of MI5 as we will give to all the critical evidence given to the inquiry. In order to do that, it will be necessary for part of that evidence to be given in a closed hearing. To do otherwise would risk assisting terrorists to carry out further attacks and make them more deadly, which no right-thinking person wants. So, may we be plain, the only reason that part of this inquiry will take place in a closed session is because of our determination to ensure that future attacks are prevented to the extent that that is possible. Preventability is, of course, also of very significant interest to the authorities themselves. Efforts have already been made to understand whether there is anything to be learned from the attack in Manchester which would strengthen and improve the work of MI5, counter-terrorism police and other authorities in the future. The Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament published a report entitled The 2017 Acts, What Needs to Change? It did so in November 2018, to which the government responded in January 2019. Moreover, the intelligence agencies and counter-terrorism policing also conducted their own internal reviews. <coughs> These reviews were overseen by David Anderson QC, now Baron Anderson of Ipswich, who was the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation between 2011 and 2017. He published a report setting out his own assessment of the reviews in December 2017. Lord Anderson concluded that it is conceivable that the Manchester attack might have been averted, quotes, had the cards fallen differently although he emphasised that there is a high degree of inherent uncertainty in speculating as to what might or might not have been discovered at MI5 and CT policing, investigators Salman Abedi in early 2017. This inquiry will have regard to the findings and conclusions of all of these previous pieces of work, but, we emphasise, will conduct its own independent investigation taking into account further information that has come to light in the past two years. The inquiry will make its own finding in relation to preventability and be bound by no one and no organisation. The inquiry is committed to the maximum possible transparency and openness in all it does. However, it's important to say that it's intrinsic to the functions of MI5 and counter-terrorism policing, that much of their work must, to achieve our safety, be carried out in secret. As has been extensively canvassed in the course of several preliminary hearings, if details of the techniques, procedures and processes used by these organisations were made public, or the particulars of the intelligence obtained through them, there is a significant danger that this could assist future <coughs> would-be attackers to carry out further or more deadly atrocities. It is therefore necessary in the interest of national security for much of the evidence in Chapter 14 to be heard in a closed hearing, as we have said. That was also true of the ISC. Their published report contains numerous redactions to protect national security sensitive information. It was also true of Lord Anderson's work. Although his report was published, the underlying reviews have remained classified, and it must be true also of this inquiry. We repeat, we wish to do what we can to prevent future attacks, not facilitate them. So whilst we will do everything that we properly can in open, 
there will have to be a portion of the evidence that must be heard in closed hearings. Despite the fact that much of the preventability chapter must be dealt with in closed, two open witness statements have been provided on behalf of MI5 and counter-terrorism policing. All evidence will be heard in an open hearing from Witness J and DCS Dominic Scully. Insofar as it's possible to do so in public, this will cover the following. The context of the broader terrorism threat in May 2017, the procedures and processes which were in place at that time to investigate and disrupt potential terrorist attacks, including how MI5 and counter-terrorism policing work together and share information. It will include a description of how persons are designated as subjects of interest by MI5. That's to say, as someone who is to be investigated as a possible threat to national security, and how and why persons cease being SOIs. The evidence will address how previous or closed SOIs are monitored to see if the investigation into them should be reopened, including a process codenamed Clematis. The evidence will address the prevent strand of the government's counter-terrorism contest strategy, how it works and how referrals are made. It will look also at the history of Salman Abedi's past interactions with police and those of his family, at what MI5 and counter-terrorism policing knew about Salman Abedi before the attack and why further steps to investigate him were not taken at the time. And so we will repeat that. In the open evidence, to the extent possible, we will explore what MI5 and CTP knew about Salman Abedi before the attack and why further steps to investigate him were not taken at the time. And the evidence will address what lessons have been learned as a result of the post-attack review process and what changes have been made <coughs> in response. At least two other witnesses in the open hearing will also be relevant to preventability issues. The first is Sean Hipgrave of the Home Office, who we've already mentioned in relation to Chapter 7, Security Arrangements, and Chapter 13, Radicalisation. His statement also covers the regulation of explosive precursor chemicals and the use of travel monitoring and border control tools. These were both issues identified as requiring further work by the ISC in their report. And we will explore with him what more, if anything, could have been done or should have been done to use these measures to identify Simon Abedi's plans or track him at the time of his return to the United Kingdom on the 18th of May 2017. The second witness is Paul Mott of HMPPS, the Prison and Probation Service. Much of his statement is, as we described earlier, relevant to the issues of radicalisation in Chapter 13. However, what he says about the processes and procedures that could have been used to monitor or stop prison visits and telephone contact between Salman Abedi and Abdulrouf Abdallah may be of interest in relation to preventability and will need to be investigated further. And we know that the Chairman will keep under close review whether any other witnesses whose evidence is relevant to preventability are able to give evidence in open. Any witness whose evidence can be heard in open will be heard in open. We turn now to set out the key facts on issues of preventability in a little more detail insofar as it's possible to do that publicly. We'll hear, as we indicated, from Witness J and DCS Scully about how Salman Abedi was known to MI5 and CT policing prior to the attack and indeed was due to be considered for further investigation when the attack took place. We'll hear how information about Simon Abedi was first passed to the security service by Northwest Counter-Terrorism Unit in December 2010 because his details were linked to another subject of interest. It was assessed that there was nothing suspicious at that time 
and so there was no further investigation. However, on the 18th of March 2014, Salman Abedi was designated as an SOI and began to be investigated by MI5, as a telephone number registered to him was in contact with another SOI thought to be involved in planning travel to Syria for extremist purposes. That investigation ceased on the 21st of July 2014, as Salman Abedi was assessed not to be a national security risk. Salman Abedi was identified as having met with or been in telephone contact with two other SOIs in 2015. He was also identified as a second level contact, that is to say a contact of a contact, of SOIs in 2016 and 2017. On two occasions between 2011 and 2016, MI5 and counter-terrorism policing made checks due to information received about Salman Abedi's travel overseas, as there was concern he may be travelling to Syria. However, it was determined that he had in fact gone to Europe on the first occasion and Libya on the second, and it was assessed there was nothing to indicate he posed a risk at that time. MI5 also held information that indicated Salman Abedi had visited a known extremist in prison on more than one occasion. But after further information was sought, it was assessed that this did not justify reopening Salman Abedi as an SOI. Probably of most interest to all, in particular the bereaved families, we will hear how on two separate occasions in the months prior to the attack, MI5 received intelligence about Salman Abedi, the significance of which was not fully appreciated at the time, but which, in retrospect, can be seen to be highly relevant to the planned attack. And finally, we will hear that on the 3rd of March 2017, Salman Abedi was one of 685 closed SOIs who hit a priority indicator under the Clematis process. Following triage on the 1st of May 2017, Salman Abedi was assessed as meeting the threshold to be considered for further investigation. He was due to be considered for referral at a meeting scheduled for the 31st of May, but tragically, this was overtaken by the events of nine days earlier. All of those matters of evidence will be explored. It is not possible to describe the additional evidence to be heard in the closed hearing in any detail for obvious reasons. However, we will explore the evidence given by Witness J and DCS Scally as corporate witnesses fully, including the information contained in the underlying documentation, which was the subject of a successful application for public interest immunity. We will also hear factual evidence from those in MI5 and counter-terrorism policing who were directly involved in the relevant decision-making. Moreover, and importantly, the chairman is in the process of instructing an expert to assist him in considering whether the assessments and decisions made were reasonable given what was known at the time, uh, whether those would have been different had other information been available, and what actions would have been taken had different assessments or decisions been made. That expert will necessarily need to give evidence in closed. The issues for consideration by the inquiry in relation to preventability will be as follows. Why the decision was taken to close Salman Abedi as an SOI in July 2014 and whether that decision was reasonable given the information available. Why Salman Abedi was not reopened as an SOI after October 2015 and whether that was reasonable given the information available whether there was other information or intelligence which could or should have been available to MI5 or counter-terrorism policing that would have led to Salman Abedi being reopened as an SOI. Whether any further destructive action would or should have been taken in relation to Salman Abedi if a different assessment had been made. In particular, 
whether Simon Abedi should have been referred to the REVENT programme at any stage and what difference that might have made, and whether travel monitoring and travel restriction capabilities should have been utilised in relation to Simon Abedi in 2017. Other issues include whether Simon Abedi's visits to a known extremist prisoner should have led to any further investigation, why the intelligence received on two occasions in the months prior to the attack was not assessed as being more significant at the time, and what other actions could have been taken in response to that intelligence and whether it should have stopped the attack. All of those issues will be subject to the most intense scrutiny. That brings us to the end of our opening statement. It's taken some time to introduce the facts that the chairman will need to consider and the issues that he will need to decide. We wish to emphasise what the chairman said in his introductory remarks. This is a search for the truth. As will be obvious, the process of hearing the evidence to enable the decisions to be made by the chairman will be lengthy. That process will start with the critically important commemorative hearing, which will commence on Monday next, and we will sit each day during that hearing at 9.30am. Uh, Mr Cooper, are, are you going first with the commemorative hearings? As I, as I understand it, yes. There's and a list that's been given to us and we're all aware of it. Uh, we're also going to employ a collaborative approach between uh, family CPs to ensure Thank that you. all have access to those hearings when it uh, matters to them. And is 9.30 <coughs> a convenient time for the families to start? As I understand it, yes. There's been nothing raised with me to the contrary, and I know questions of that nature have already been asked, so thank you. Thank you, and that's true of the other teams as well. Thank you very much. Mr Greeny, I'm extremely grateful. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and uh, see you all at 9.30 on Monday morning. All stand.